Create the teach-in section of the Occupy Memphis movement with a talk today. I was invited to come down, as I say in a moment in the speech. I wrote this, however, because I'm a true academic and have a hard time at living. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't misquoted. So uh, forgive me if I, my head stays a little buried in it and I don't look up at you personally. But I feel connected to you all here today and don't let my delivery uh, guise that at all. The talk that I'm delivering is entitled, I Have a Recurring Dream, Occupying Memphis and the Connection Between the Fat Cat and the Eagle. And my intent today, let me underline for you before I start, is to make connections for you. That's where I think your teach-ins need to act or to operate, in connective tissue. I've been asked to come down to the occupation here in Memphis and address you today. I am proud and honored to do so, as I greatly support your efforts here and throughout the Occupy Together movement. I cannot, of course, avoid certain reflections and connections as we stand just blocks away from the Civil Rights Museum and the hallowed ground where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. As many of you know, King came to Memphis for a sanitation workers' strike to support a labor movement that was not disconnected from a racialist movement. And it was these connections that King was beginning to emphasize at the latter part of his life that perhaps got him assassinated, as many have now chronicled. He was not simply fighting for black rights or simply equal opportunity employment, but was shifting his attention to a crucial link between imperialism and capitalism, between issues of labor and ideologies of othering, and between the New Jerusalem and the New Rome, which he called Fun Town. In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, we can begin to see the initial spark of this connection as he discusses Fun Town in a powerful passage, which I'll quote to you. We have waited more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence. But we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see the beginning, or, sorry, her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. This is the essence of King's earlier message, the desire to reinflate Fun Town to its original promise the desire to make good on the American dream. And here too, we can see the difference between King at this point in his understanding and Malcolm X. King wanted again to reinflate Fun Town, right? Pump it up. Malcolm wanted to explode it. This is perhaps the dilemma you find yourselves in as you protest. And perhaps like King, you too will find it necessary to make connections and to develop your understanding as you develop the understanding of those who watch you in this moment. What King came to before he came to Memphis, however, is the crucial step. King realized that labor and class were inseparable from the movement for racial equality. And that American imperialism was the great problem as it allowed for the importation of yet another labor force to supplant the lost labor from a new black bourgeoisie. In short, the Vietnam War was the problem and pointed to a global situation where the plantation master had become the director of American foreign policy. 
King realized, as Bob Marley sings, that equal opportunity, employment, is not freedom. That assimilation into the middle class is a betrayal of any revolution that fights against race and class oppression. And that the enemy was not the fat cat in his greed, but the scratching post of bourgeois ideology itself. The problem was not an evil, nor a sin, but a discourse, and an ideology, an ideo ideological matrix even, ideas and fictions that had to be exposed and altered, as Toni Morrison would say so many years later. Goodness and blackness and sameness would never win the day against such powerful ideas as essential difference and the preeminence of property. What King needed to do was to make an explosion as well. And this is what they perhaps rejoiced in his death over. He was going to make connections. He was going to get to the heart of it. He was going after the eagle, not merely the fat cat. And this meant that his movement was connected to other revolutions in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Southeast Asia, even to the French Revolution, even to the colonial war that we call the American Revolution. This brings us to the most important of these connections and the conjurings that I'll conduct today, the Haitian Revolution, the only successful slave revolution in the history of humanity. Spartacus has failed, if you remember. So too are you still connected to it today, for as you stand here, Haiti is still left unstanding, bereft, cleaved. In a famous historical moment, the Napoleonic troops sent to quell Toussaint Louverture and his, rev his revolution approached the Haitian slave army and they heard a strange noise. They thought it was a foreign song, some African chant, some of them later commented. They edged closer to realize in their astonishment that the Haitians were singing La Marseillaise back to them. And their own anthem of freedom sung back to them as if to underscore the very gap in the French Revolution. The expropriation of the Declaration of Rights to those upon whose backs history has been written, carved, and whipped. That expropriation we now call human rights. The astonishment of the French is, of course, a symptom of their ideological blindness. The other was not other at all, but we had to make him other so that we could perpetuate the exclusionary moralities that made us the self and that legitimized our claim to a state as a new emergent bourgeoisie. And quite frankly, that is the moment we are still engaged in today. This is what we must understand ourselves and what we must make our oppressors understand. These connections are the root. And as we all know, if you're gonna water the tree of liberty, you better begin at the root. Marx once called the French Revolution a tragedy and then a farce. Why? What was the tragedy? that Napoleon would become emperor outfitted with plumes and epaulets that were borrowed from the uniform of the aristocrat. The farce was much more troubling, however, and I believe that we must underline it today in order to clarify our cause. It can be reduced to a notion of legitimacy. Why do the people in the rich mansions of Memphis deserve those estates? How do they justify their possession? Aristocrats had justified their estates through a myth of ontological being. In other words, their being was in their blood, their right was in their blood, and their might, of course. They were blue bloods, just as we still have in the South, I believe. They were old money. You know this from old Germantown. A new class, the bourgeoisie, new Germantown, rose to take these estates from them, but still had to justify their right to them, which they did with a slew of ideological sleights of hand. With philosophers from John Locke to Anne Rand, 
an economic theorist from Adam Smith to Milton Friedman, supporting them all the way, and with a new religion meant to increase the possessive rights of this new class. Ontological right gave way to epistemological right to a state. The middle class created such new ideologies as reason and industry, self-reliance, and the new individual. Their new literature became the novel, a form dedicated to the individual. Their new God believed them elect and believed the sign of their election to be their wealth. Their new protectors were these guys called police. And we wonder whether or not Memphis police know their own history. Do you know about Sir Robert Peel? Do you know that it was 1829 completely coeval with the rise of capitalism? Do you know that you were crafted in Ireland? How did we come from the tithe war to the NYPD? Their new legitimacy was guised in the most pernicious ideology of them all, respectability. They had culture, decorum, taste. Theirs was the world of prop propriety, and it was that properness that gave them their new property. They could no longer employ slaves as they had legitimized war captives in an aristocracy. Now they needed to create ideas like wage laborers, race, and essential difference, and use the brilliance of the new sciences to justify such differences. This is why so many theorists have argued that we must see race as a mask for class without discounting racist and racialist realities. Poor white labor is pitted against poor black labor while their protests never direct themselves at the ones on top, at the one percent, at the master and his mastery. This too is the connection to feminism and its attendant revolutions. The estate was still passed down through a woman's body in what we call the economics of the womb. And this is why race, class, and gender are the inseparable focal points of your cause. Your city council just a few days ago underscored such connections when it decided to violate the separation of powers provision of your constitution and collude church and state. Bringing back Planned Parenthood would only begin to resolve this situation, I hope you understand. The point of such a quick critical history is that you are here today connected to the dead who fought in all of these struggles. And your cause, I would argue, cannot simply be the rectification of your privilege. You cannot simply be angry because you are out of work or because you do not enjoy the comforts you once had. Your oppressor is not one evil man, again, but a system and an ideology. It is not simply capitalism, but disaster capitalism, global, transnational, corporate capitalism. It is not simply the beast of American imperialism, but all types of mastery and neo-colonialism, racist, sexist, classist, and theistic. It is not your exclusion that matters, but the exclusionary moralities that underline every aspect of your culture. It is not just the possessions of the rich, but the very idea of possession itself. A different kind of possession is happening in Memphis today. We're having a possession ritual right here in Memphis. We're conjuring the dead of history. They dance inside of us and compel us to fight on, to remember ourselves and to reinvent ourselves at the same time. As Zizek warned you on Wall Street a week or so ago now, don't fall in love with yourselves. Lacan once looked out upon the Paris uprising of 1968 and declared, you will get the revolution you deserve. Beware that you deserve more than simply narcissistic rage, an inflation of the dream of a narcissistic America. Yours must be a revolution of mind, in other words, as well as voice. 
of the calm deliberation of critical consciousness as well as the cry of outrage. Your no must be followed by a constant cry of not enough. And this means for yourselves as well. Orthodoxy is the graveyard of creativity, as Chinua Achebe once warned us. Remember the notion as you constantly move forward in revolutionary positions, always critiquing, never satisfied with the easy slogan or the sensual gratification of having protested once when you were young. Democracy demands the constant threat of revolution. It is what makes it work. So the revolution's time has not come now. It is always here. This is not the time for the revolution. It must always be the time for revolution as a check upon those who think that history will be forgotten, that humans are socio-biologically inclined, inclined to seek power and oppress that the only truth is the atavistic mastery of the eagle. We may overcome, but the truth is that we will need to keep overcoming until we all cross over. One of my first memories is hearing Bobby Kennedy say famously now that we can do better than this. The media tells you that you do not have a clear message despite videos that, are, that clearly contradict such absurdities. But the absurdity is that you would need to have a solution in order to desire a fight for freedom. Were black slaves asked first if they could come up with a better system before they rose up against the inhuman trade? No. We do not give prescriptions, gang. Like philosophers, we give headaches. Our only guiding principle is that we know that we can do better than this. We Memphians, we Americans, we humans can do better than this. We know that we can topple the eagle and the fat cat both together. We have no other choice but to believe in such impossibilities, I think. It is the impossibility that will free us perpetually from the compromise that lies at the myth of the possible. Let me add the crucial spice. It is education that will ensure our freedom. This has been the greatest target of their disaster capitalism. Take New Orleans, if you don't know, our beloved sister, for an example. Before Katrina, there were over 100 public schools in NOLA. Now there are something like five. All the rest were transformed into charter schools. The same thing is happening in Memphis and we must declare the charter schools reverse civil rights gains. We demand not just education, but affordable, even free education. Public education, and not merely in the canon of great books. We do not want to be indoctrinated into being merely good citizens. We demand to be thinking citizens. Critical education then, interpretive education to replace the segmental equipping of the mind that has become our standard policy. We do not wish to be manufactured into workers and managers. We demand to be educated into free thinkers, philosophers, poets, and artists. We do not believe that profit-driven math and science will free us. We demand to be connected to the dead instead of being the ahistorical Americans that we have been for so very long. To know the history of science and math alongside the history of ideas. We do not wish to know the world as we have inherited it, becoming rabbit tricksters at best. We wish to know the world the way the world works, the better to change it, becoming lions at our best. Academic freedom is part of our struggle, therefore, and this is why your teaching is honorable and why they are cracking down so very hard upon education in our country. 
We threaten them when we think and write. We threaten them when we are versed in philosophy and history. We threaten them when we make visual art that can be understood by illiterate communities. And lest we forget, some cannot afford computers. And so Facebook had better not be our only recourse to action. Kindle is more appropriately termed, I think, kindling, because it is a way of burning our books. And they, more than Facebook, are our guides. Let me conclude then with the words of someone who wrote some powerful books, plays mostly, but there's another lesson in theater for you. They're spoken by Harold Pinter as he accepted his Nobel Prize in 2005. As every single person here knows, the justification for the invasion of Iraq was that Saddam Hussein possessed a highly dangerous body of weapons of mass destruction, some of which could be fired in 45 minutes, bringing about appalling devastation. We were assured that this was true. It was not true. We were told that Iraq had a relationship with Al-Qaeda and shared responsibility for the atrocity in New York of September 11, 2001. We were assured that this was true. It was not true. We were told that Iraq threatened the security of the world. We were assured it was true. It was not true. The truth is something entirely different. The truth has to do with how the United States, States understands its role in the world and how it chooses to embody it. The United States supported and in many cases engendered every right-wing military dictatorship in the world after the Second World War. I refer to Indonesia, Greece, Uruguay, Brazil, Paraguay, Haiti, Turkey, the Philippines, Guatemala, El Salvador, and of course, Chile. The horror the United States inflicted upon Chile in 1973 can never be purged and can never be forgiven. Hundreds of thousands of deaths took place throughout these countries. Did they take place? And are they all attributable to U.S. foreign policy? The answer is yes, they did take place. And yes, they are attributable to American foreign policy. But you wouldn't know it. It never happened. Nothing ever happened. Even when it was happening, it wasn't happening. It was of no interest. The crimes of the United States have been systematic, constant, vicious, remorseless, but very few people have actually talked about them. You have to hand it to America. It has exercised a quite clinical manipulation of power worldwide while masquerading as a force for universal good. It's a brilliant, even witty, highly successful act of hypnosis. I put to you that the United States is without doubt the greatest show on the road. Time to pull back the curtain on the great show and reveal the wizard's voice machine. This is what you're doing here today. And I thank you for inviting me to join you just as I ask all those listening outside of Memphis to join us here because this is the center of the struggle. Here are your front lines. Here's your tiger blue. One last connected bit of tissue will serve to make the point. The Wall of Wall Street. Do any of you know its history? Do you know that it's connected to race and slavery as well? The Wall of Slavery was built to keep black slaves from escaping from New York. Teach down the wall, I say. Right? We must teach down the wall in order to turn these recurring dreams into realities for the commons. And the dead will rejoice. Thanks. Yeah.